Welcome to the Three Things Podcast. I'm David Iglesias, Director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You may be wondering why this podcast is called Three Things. You were probably taught by your parents, like I was, that it was impolite to talk to people about three things, religion, politics, and money. But what happens if your job is to talk about those three things? Well, let's find out. Today we have four alumni from one of Wheaton's oldest study programs, the International Study Program, founded in 1971 by economics and business professor Robert Bartel and his wife Shirley. The program focused on political economy in Europe, first in the Netherlands, where students met economists, business persons, and political leaders, and classes led by Wheaton professors. Classes were initially held in The Hague, and then later in the northern Dutch province of Friesland. Students would travel to locations in Holland during the study portion of the program, which lasted six weeks. After the six weeks of study, students would either have a free week or travel by bus throughout continental Europe for two weeks and then finish the travel portion of the program in London. During the free week, students would scatter to the winds, either in groups or by themselves. This occurred either at the end of the program or midway between the study and travel portions of the trip. The first version of the ISP, as it became known, ran from 1971 until 1979. Later versions of the program would sporadically run until 2010, when the program was renamed ISI, or Iron Sharpens Iron, a reference to Proverbs 2717. As director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics, I've been privileged to lead the program since 2015. This year, in order to honor the founders of this influential program, I rechristened it to its original name of the International Study Program. In the interest of full disclosure, I went in 1978, and it was a professional game changer for me. On today's segment of Three Things, you will hear accounts from our four guests, Larry Abshear, Mark Mooney, Dan Johnson, and Karen Gale. Each participated in the International Study Program, but in different years. The first three in the 1970s and the final participant in 1987. I will be asking our guests to describe their summer studies and the effect it had on their lives and business careers. First, I'd like to introduce Larry Abshear, who went on the very first ISP in 1971. Larry was an economics major and graduated from Wheaton in 1973. He later received his MBA from the Washington University in St. Louis. His career in business included stints at Deloitte and Touche, chief financial officer at Sanford Brown College, and then a career of over 24 years at the Missouri Athletic Club in St. Louis, where he was the CFO and currently serves as director of advancement. Larry, welcome. Thanks, David. Very happy to participate with all of you today. Well, you are our plank holder, as we call it in the Navy, the person who was there at the very beginning, the, the laying of the keel. So how did you first hear about the ISP? Well, in uh, freshman, uh, not, not freshman year, but the um, first semester, sophomore year, um, I had Bob Bartel for our intro to economics. And that was a stimulating experience. As you know, Bob was a great lecturer and uh, he was conceiving of the program back then. And uh, I was interested in econ. I was about ready to change my major to uh, econ. And so uh, I was enthusiastic about, uh, about the program because of the way Bob described the whole experience and what it would be like. Yeah, he was quite the salesperson. Uh, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, second question is for Mark Mooney. I'd like to introduce Mark. He attended the ISP in 1975 and graduated from Wheaton with a degree in economics in 1977. His career has been with Morgan Stanley, where he is senior vice president and financial advisor. Mark has worked with Morgan Stanley for 39 years. Wow, Mark, that is an incredible fact. Guys our age don't do that anymore. Well, you should also mention that I'm halfway through an MBA program, which I started back in 1978, which I have not yet completed. So I'll be halfway through that. That They're going to put that on my gravestone. Finally, my learner. finally completed, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Mark, you, you came on scene a little bit after Larry. Uh, were there other study programs you considered? And if not, why'd you pick the ISP? You know, I was not even aware that there were other programs 
which is pretty much part of my personality. I didn't even apply to Wheaton until about a month before my freshman year. And I was not admitted as a, as a regular freshman. I had to go in as a, uh, they called it special student, although there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a special bus for me. But uh, it wasn't until a freshman dropped out that I was able to fit in uh, and become a real student at, at, at Wheaton. And uh, your mom and my mom were, were uh, students back in the 1940s together. Do you remember that? <laughs> your, your, and uh, one of their classmates was Billy Graham, as well as Hudson T. Armading. So that the, the knowledge of those people, the friendship with those two people definitely enabled me to get into the school. So I was always about a, a week behind. So I had no idea that there were other programs. It wasn't until I got back from, uh, you know, from Europe that I realized that there was Black Hills. I don't think I was sorry that I didn't go to Black Hills. Uh, there was Israel. That would have been interesting. And uh, there was also England, I guess, was that the uh, yeah. English program. And there were maybe there were others. I was, I was like I say, I was just happy that I learned of the, uh, the, the program in, in, in The Hague. And uh, so th that's how I ended up there with all my friends. Yeah, so so I think uh, there was definitely the Wheaton and Israel program by the time we were in college in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, uh, Wheaton in France and Wheaton in England. Um, and I think the East Asia study program came online about that time as well. No, true. Yeah, and, and thanks for the legacy. Uh, my mother went on the Black Hill study program. Uh, back then, Wheaton students didn't go to Europe, uh, probably because it was in, in a state of war. Um, she graduated in 1945, so that would have been a really good reason why a Wheaton student would not go to Europe. Mark? It, was it also not required back in the 70s that you spend a summer studying with Wheaton, either on campus or away from campus? So. Um, I don't think we had any choice. I think <laughs> it was either stay in Wheaton for the summer, which didn't seem like a lot of fun, or head off, you know, for for funner climates. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to all of you uh, multiple times. My third guest today is Dan Johnson. He was an econ major as well, who graduated from Wheaton in 1978. Dan attended the ISP in 1976. Dan had a 14-year career as an investment banker at Van Campen, Clayton Brown, and Dane Bosworth. He started on the entrepreneurial path, launching Dane Technologies in 1996, Verisay Software in 2000, and acquiring Levo AG in Switzerland in 2007. He currently serves as the CEO of Dane and chairman of Levo AG. Uh, Dan, I've got a hard question for you. Why did you choose the ISP? Uh, thanks, David. I'm happy to share the, the uh, I think Larry touched on it. Bob Bartel was a great salesman. And uh, I will say that I was blessed to be encouraged by him to look at the program. Um, and after he shared with me what they would be covering, which was perfectly aligned with what my personal interests were, I had never been to Europe and uh, the combination of his salesmanship and my interest in, in getting some exposure to this vast world that I hadn't experienced before that uh, pretty much sealed the deal. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, I I listened to another sales person that was Steve Dawson, who should have graduated in 1976. He's a friend of Mark's, and Steve went the year before me, and he he told me about this mythical program, this Camelot program, and just pitched it so hard that I, that I sold my car. I had an Audi Fox four door sedan, dirty brown color, and I sold it. Yeah. And years later, I said, Bob Bartel, you owe me a car. Yeah. Uh, I actually sold a Leica C3 to pay for part of it. I am so glad to hear somebody else sold a car <laughs> <laughs> to go well, in the it program. It was a cam nice camera, but uh, life-changing decision. I mean, I think if I would say anything, uh, we all have inflection points in our life where we make decisions that fundamentally alter our trajectory. And the decision to attend ISP, I just feel so blessed that... Uh, Bob shared, Bart, Dr. Bartell shared that with us, with me, and that I followed his, his uh, urging. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Our final guest today is Karen Kennedy Gale. She was a political science major who graduated from Wheaton in 1989. Karen worked for HQ Global Workplaces and Regis for 18 years, rising through the ranks to become general manager. For the past 14 years, she's worked at Fort Wheaton College. She's a director of alumni and parent programs, and Karen attended the ISP in 1987. Karen, here's my question for you. What was your biggest takeaway from the ISP? 
Yeah, wow. Um, well, there are a lot of takeaways for me um, from ISP, um, but I guess if I had to pick probably the biggest one for me uh, would be that ISP provided my first real encounter with experiential learning. Um, the entire process of studying intensively on campus. We did that for, I think it was about 10 days. Um, and studying just intensively on campus with a group of my peers and then taking our show on the road uh, was unlike anything I've ever experienced. Um, I love the intensity of the study together and then you know the ability to just dive in um, on one topic and in this case economics and the countries that, and the governmental systems of the cover the countries we were visiting. Then when you added visiting um, the countries and seeing those offices where we study or of what we were studying was, I mean, that was outstanding. Um, for me, it was fascinating to study the politics and the economics of every country that we visited from inside out. And so eye-opening to see so many of the Wheaton connections um, yes. in many of the places where we were visiting as well. Um, Beyond that, I would say that my ISP experience definitely shaped my curiosity about geopolitical happenings and events in this world. And of course, that's just, I mean, that's just been interesting over the past 34 years to just watch our world um, shift and change. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that's changed from what we visited uh, during the Cold War um, than what Europe is like today. So yeah, it was great experience. Yeah, your comments about the, the, the political side ring true, because uh, the only time I ever saw Jimmy Carter when he was president was in Berlin. I've got a picture of him riding in an open air sedan with with the German chancellor, uh, Willie, I think it was Willie Brandt. Yeah. Um, and he's got this arm up. He looks like Caesar, like Julius Caesar and not <laughs> Jimmy Carter. Uh, and I've always thought, you know, I should probably send this picture to his library because it's I mean, he looks like a complete hero, you know. <laughs> Um, but that's that was my introduction to kind of the political world way ahead of when I actually got involved in politics. Um, anyway, so uh, here's a general question uh, for the four of you. And if more than one want to answer, that's absolutely fine. But but here's the thing. Uh, I did some polling uh, a few years ago, uh, and I wanted to find out what impact international study programs like this had for the Wheaton student. Um, and the results were astounding. 70% rated their international study program as their top Wheaton College experience. That's seven zero percent And then the other 30% rated the study program as one of my best Wheaton College experience. So my question for, for the group is, are you surprised at these numbers? Yeah, uh, I, have, Dan. I have to I say I'm, I was completely uh, shocked, actually, because, I mean, I don't know what those other 30 <laughs> percent were thinking about, but uh, this this was uh, hands down the best experience of anyone. Uh, uh, in speaking with colleagues that went over the years, everyone loved ISP. And I um, my wife had the experience of going to the Black Hills. And it's safe to say that the experience was pretty significantly different. <laughs> yeah, boy, I sure hope I don't get any angry fan mail from Black Hills uh, alumni. But yeah, I, I, I can't imagine it, uh, it being very exciting. Uh, do you want to add to that, Mark? Yes, please. I was going to say that my entire four years at Wheaton were, to me, were like, you know, belonging to the most um, unique and uh, exclusive country club that anybody could ever join. So just right off the, you know, right off the bat, your freshman year, Fisher Dorm, the level of socialization is just super intense. For me, Wheaton was 70% social, 30% studying, which was actually a step up from my high school days, where I think the ratio was like 8 to 20. Um, but when you get to when you get to Europe, you know, with all your friends, um, and there was we were all sophomores going into our junior year. There were quite a few others there that were going into their senior year, and we did seem to kind of have our little clicks. But the 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 intensity of the social, I mean, living together, the the going from a dorm to a uh to the, the what do they call the embassy in at the in Vassanar at the yeah. egg that was amazing it was it's so fortunate that, that we were not at the age of snoring yet or none of us would have gotten any sleep at all <laughs> we weren't good. snoring but we didn't sleep too much either <laughs> yeah we we had so so the bartels got us all uh 
bi bicycles to ride because we were by the time I went, we were up in the Dutch countryside in Friesland and it was a conference center. So it wasn't a beautiful, you know, former embassy. It was just a big conference center. But the bikes were great because you could hop on the bike at any time and go anywhere. Uh, and one of my scary stories was I always wondered why the Europeans had uh, st scary stories about dark woods and witches and wolves. Well, I found out because there was no lighting in this forest uh, uh, highway and there was a canopy that was so uh, dense that you couldn't see the stars or moon. So we would go biking down at midnight, you know, uh, just hoping that we were going straight or we'd crash into the, you know, into the forest. Uh, at any rate, uh, Larry or Karen, you, you want to add anything to that about the polling? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me in the, the least. And I probably would agree that I'm shocked that there were 30% of people that didn't say it was the highlight of their experience. But um, yeah, I just, I mean, for me, it's just a game changer. It opened my whole world. I hadn't been outside of the country um, yeah. prior to my experience in ISP. And um, yeah, it just opened my whole world to different cultures, different just experiences in general. And, and what it did to just elevate my learning was just unbelievable. Um, you know, to mm -hmm. prior to ISP, I had just sat in a classroom and read, you know, it was traditional style learning, you know, that was right. grew up in the seventies, you sat your classroom, read your books, you studied for your tests, that was it, you know, and then to take the show on the road and actually see what you were learning and experience it, it was just unlike anything. I mean, it was the exclamation point at the end of the lesson, like yeah. none other. So, that's so good, good Larry, way to please. say it, Karen. That's that's great. I agree with everything that has been said. It's a just a fantastic experience. So, so Dan, I have a question for you. Uh, what what did you learn from your ISP trip that you later used in business? Because I think you have traveled to Europe quite a bit in the intervening years. Yeah, I mean, uh, who knew when I was sitting in that uh, that classroom learning about. Um, international economics and currency exchange rates and those sorts of things that I would actually be dealing with it uh, for a good chunk of my life. I think the, there, we learned tons of lessons, but I, I think the fundamental two that I came away with was uh, that uh, government financial policy uh, uh, drives currency values and currency values drive business and trade. And we live and breathe that in our, my business every day. I mean, uh, whether it's the, the Swiss franc to dollar exchange rate or the Swiss franc to the euro exchange rate, we have a business based in Switzerland. My costs there are based in Switzerland. We sell around the world. And I have to think about that lesson that I learned mm -hmm. on ISP in 1976 on, on a pretty regular basis, or mm -hmm. certainly at the end of the month when we threw up our, our currency situation. Second is... Uh, more of that to pick up on Karen's theme of experiential, experiential learning. I mean, I, I grew up in the U.S. and, and had, a, a, had a very uh, U.S.-centric view. I'd not been outside the United States. And, and ISP exposed me to people and cultures and history that was so eye-opening. And all of the preconceived notions that I had of that, uh, wherever you get them from, uh, some positive, some just uninformed, uh, were shattered on that experience. The people were, that we um, encountered were so gracious and helpful in so many ways. And uh, it really, I've seen that actually in, in my work internationally. The world's a big place and a lot of people in it are really open and friendly and it's, it was great to be introduced to that and prepped for that by ISP. Well, that's great stuff. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Dan. Uh, anyone else wanna? Yes, Larry. Well, this is a little bit of an anecdote, but uh, I remember um, going to the um, Tulip um, <laughs> yeah. place in Hell's yes. Warehouse. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And do you remember the Dutch auction? Did, did you mm -hmm. see that? I mean, um, you know, you hear some people, most of us, I guess, know what a Dutch auction is. Some people don't. Mm. But the first time I was interest, introduced to it, the concept was right there in Alzmeer. And um, I could see it actually happening, how they do it. And, um, and so years later, when maybe I'm in 
whatever class or whatever business situation and somebody says something about a Dutch auction, I can say, I know what this is about because I've seen it done. Well, so, I mean, I remember the acres and acres of tulips, but I got to tell you, I don't remember the auction. What is a Dutch auction, Larry? Well, um, they, they, they wheel out the, the, uh, the um, carts of flowers, mm -hmm. and then they've got a big dial on the, um, on the wall. It's a big broom, and all the bidders uh, are there, and they're going to, and then they start at a very high price, and then, then the dial goes downward, and you can just say, I'll buy it at that price, and you've got it. Because, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not like you're bidding things up. You're watching the price go down, and you can get it at, get in it whenever you want, and you've got it. You bought it at wow. that price. Interesting, and, and I it's think more, it's, it's 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 less time consuming, and it's very very efficient because they've got to get those flowers out of there fast right. so they can get them onto planes. Well, and that's what I remember from the Dutch. They were so efficient about everything. I mean, so that doesn't surprise me that they figured out a way to make the the bidding process more efficient. Mark, you want to add to that? Oh, yeah, I was thinking that the uh, tulip, what was it called back in the 1800s when there was a tulip prices went crazy? Bubble, the tulip bubble. Yeah, and now now we have cryptocurrency doing similar things. But when I joined Morgan Stanley almost 40 years ago, it'll be 40 years this this year, um, by having been you know on the Europe study program, it certainly made me much more comfortable you know investing in all the other countries, in, including the U.S. And actually, that really saved my skin during the first decade of this century, uh, foreign, you know, Europe, Asia uh, actually outperformed the U.S. The U.S. had a net return of zero for the first 10 years of this of this century. I only wish I'd switched back strictly to the, <laughs> over the last 10 years. That would have been far better for all my clients and myself. But anyway, yeah, the, having been there, um, you know, back in this in the 70s was was also a huge um, beginning for my career as a stockbroker. Well, that's great. And I think all of us went to Europe while there was no European Union or Euro dollar. I think there were, it was still separate currencies, right? Deutschmarks, francs. Gilders. Uh, Gilders, pounds. Yeah, we. Yeah. I still have a bunch of those, actually. I, have to say. Too. <laughs> I think I do as well. Uh, so so here's kind of a softball question um, that anyone who is more than welcome to answer. Uh, uh, would you recommend today's Wheaton student to consider an international study trip, uh, particularly the international study program that I'll be hosting or leading next summer, Lord willing? Karen. Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely, no question about it. Um, if the opportunity presents itself and it's going to, I think, I think every Wheaton student can benefit from an international study trip for sure. Um, traveling internationally, it expands your worldview. It accentuates your learning. I mean, I think your learning's accelerated um, due to the travel and the experience of being there together. And I think the bonus in all of it is travel builds confidence, yes. lifelong memories. I think even lifelong friends. I'm still buddies with my ISP friends today. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these years later. So um, yeah, it was, it's worth it. Absolutely. Okay, Larry, yes, sir. Yeah, I think every uh, college student uh, should have an international experience, um, maybe not in Europe, but somewhere because of everything that uh, Karen mentioned. It's just, it broadens your horizons. It's, it's just a great thing. And I was thinking about those students um, that can't afford it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, especially for us Wheaton grads to try to make, make it uh, possible for our Wheaton students who right. who want to do it should do it. We should make make it affordable for them, and th I'm happy to be engaged uh, in that effort to some extent. But it's very important. Uh, Mark or uh, Dan, want to want to add to that? Sure. Uh, do it. Sign up now. Sign up right now. Another softball. What's your favorite story from your ISP summer? While you're thinking, I'll share my story. And that was, uh, I went to Berlin with two friends and uh, I think it was a 4th of July weekend. There was nothing planned. So we took the train. We were awakened every hour or two in uh, East Germany by scary looking guards with automatic weapons. 
uh, stayed at a hostel in West Berlin. And then we went through Checkpoint Charlie, walked around the, the, the streets of East Berlin, and I was struck by how ugly and governmental those buildings were and that there was no free there was there was no mar there was no commercial activity there was no business there it was just ugly yeah. government buildings and then we went back through checkpoint charlie and west berlin was this oasis just beautiful and like mark i was not especially a deep thinker in my uh, early 20s but i thought you know this is like jack handy's deep thoughts i had the first deep thought of the summer and i thought Communism doesn't work. Capitalism works. How do I know? Because I can see it, you know, and I took pictures and whatnot. So I think I've given you all enough time to think about your favorite story. Who wants to go first? Well, I'll go first. All right, Larry. I remember uh, in Bossinar, uh nearby, there was a big athletic field, and we used to play softball there uh, on weekends. And it, actually, it was I guess it was more of a soccer type thing, but it was big. You could do baseball or soccer, whatever. So one one night in the late afternoon, a friend of mine and I decided to go over there and just run around the track. Well, there was a guy walking his dog around the track. And when we got onto the track, this dog came came after us. Oh boy. And chased us all the way across the field, up an embankment, and we had to hurry up and scale the fence uh, and to get away from that little dog. I'll never forget that. Oh boy, that's a good one. Yeah. Mark. It's funny that Larry would mention that field because that's some of my favorite memories also. I think at least every weekend we would challenge the locals to a soccer game. And my year in, in, in you know ISP, we traveled, the guys that came from Wheaton with me were all of, you know, from the soccer team. And so we, we had the best team. So we beat them every weekend. Um, but then interacting with the locals or the natives was always interesting. You know, they like to practice their, their uh, English and we love to practice our uh, Spanish, but we were in the wrong country. No, so actually they would uh, they'd say, where are you from? And we would say Chicago. And they would immediately conjure up images of gangs. You know, we were, we were part of a gang. So I had to clarify that. Well, actually, personally, I'm from Los Angeles. Next thing you know, I'm actually a hell's angel. That's so that, <laughs> you can't argue with them because their English isn't that good, nor is our. So there's my story. That's a good one, Karen or Dan. Any anything yeah, to share? Um, I have. I remember trading goods like branded T-shirts and old Levi's went for lots of goods, and I uh, I still have the Russian nesting doll that mm -hmm. I had traded an old pair of Levi's jeans for. And uh, yeah, that was that was really fun. Also, very eye opening as well because of this, it was the Slavic Gospel had sent Bibles with us to put in our bags, with the intention of when we crossed over the border from we went from Helsinki Finland into uh, Leningrad, uh, but when we crossed the border into into the Soviet Union, you know they stopped, they searched all our bags, and they wanted them to take the Bibles, huh. which they all seized our Bibles, but they want it because it would get them into the black market. Ah. And um, so that was, that was also very exciting um, mm. to kind of be a part of that, to, to know that the Bibles had gotten into the, the country in some way. So yeah, wow. that was fun. Well, I, I think that field uh, had a, a good story for a good friend of mine, Tim Anderson and I, we're out looking for a place to play tennis. We were both avid tennis players and there were no public tennis courts anywhere to be found mm -hmm. in Vassanar. And as we were riding our bikes down that uh, road that went to the beach, we looked off to the right and, and we could see some tennis courts kind of down this little driveway and we would drove in there and there wasn't anybody around and no really buildings anywhere no nearby. So we promptly got out there and started hitting a uh, tennis ball and got about a set or two into it. And some guy came up to us and spoke to us in Dutch. And we, uh, we promptly uh, indicated that we didn't have a clue of what he was saying. And when he asked us in English, uh, he said, uh, this is a private club. And where are you from? And we <laughs> nervously said, well, we're just students and we're uh, staying down the, down the road at the, at the embassy there, uh, 427 Reedstradweg. Wow. Oh, 
he said, well, that's interesting. And, and, uh, but he said, but this is a private club. You, you really you can't play here. And so we're kind of slunk, slinking back to, uh, <laughs> to campus thinking we were in serious trouble. And uh, about three days later, we received a letter from the De Cavitan uh, Tennis and Cricket Club inviting us to be summer uh, members for five guilders for the summer. Nice. And how much was a guilder? I don't remember. I thought they were like uh, two and a half guilders to a dollar. I mean, it was it was like a very modest fee oh, yeah. to be a summer member. Uh, it was uh, it was it was one of those chance encounters where uh, we were we were very graciously welcomed by uh, the Dutch people. We had a similar experience in Paris. It was it was again eye opening how kind and gracious mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. were to us. Uh, as as American students. So, Mark, what what was your biggest takeaway? I mean, it's been a long time, but when you look back, biggest takeaway. Well, yeah, it didn't hit me till you know till I was home and and older and more mature that I really missed a, an amazing opportunity that I've tried to grasp back onto. My father, you know, was in North Africa, nineteen forty, late forty two, forty three, with the third division, and fought in ten campaigns, bringing him from you know, Germany, I'm sorry, North Africa into Sicily, Italy, Austria, yep. France, and then finally Germany. So there I was based other than the North Africa part, I was covering the same territory that he had covered um, in the 1940s to 1945 um, on the ground. And so I, I, I wish, for example, that I'd gone to Dachau. Um, I, know that some uh, of my, I know that some of my fellow students did go there. Um, yeah. but my, my father, by the time the war ended, he was a captain. And he and the Russian counterpart ceremoniously opened the, the gates of Dachau, mm -hmm. which was kind of a, you know, sad, rather meaningless um, gesture on the part of the uh, of the allies, because by that time it was far too late. You know, the, the Holocaust had, had done its damage. But um, I didn't even learn, as, as you always hear, you know, your parents don't, your father, rather, or your, your military um, parent doesn't talk about his, his uh, experience, especially in World War II. And I didn't even learn about much of this until I was much, much older. So I think I missed a great opportunity at the time that I was, you know, 20 years old. That I now realize much later that I could experience a lot of what he had seen. It's interesting. In 1975, there was still a lot of damage to you know, churches in Germany and other things that had not been rebuilt yet. So I, I remember looking at that and just thinking, wow, this is weird. They've had all these years to rebuild and they haven't done it. But again, that was my biggest sorrow was not knowing what my dad, mm. who was nine, by the way, he had plenty of time to talk about it, but he just chose not to. Yeah, that was pretty common with the greatest generation because the experiences were so traumatic. Uh, you know, they, they didn't want to go back there. We also went, the, the, the Bartels took us to, to Dachau, and that was uh, uh, the most depressing and evil place I'd been until I took Wheaton students in 2017 to uh, uh Auschwitz Birkenau in Poland, because the because Dachau was pretty small, pretty compact. They 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 did kill people there, but at uh, Auschwitz Birkenau it was industrial. I mean it was massive, and just the entire infrastructure. Uh, yeah, it's clearly the most depressing place I've ever been. Um, I took another group of Wheaton students uh, to. Uh, not to the killing fields of Cambodia, but to a, a place where they interrogated and tortured people in Phnom Penh, uh, just so students can understand graphically that evil does exist, you know, um, and that uh, there is good and evil in this world. Uh, Dan, biggest takeaway? Um, I, I, for me, the just the exposure to geography, history, culture, uh, it was like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. There were so many uh, things I learned. You know, one of the bigger takeaways that that uh, became apparent there, we tend to think of these countries as uh, along the lines of the geographic borders that exist today. And I think one of the things I, I initially learned on ISP and have seen throughout the time that I've spent uh, traveling is many of these countries are, are still very, I'll call it tribal. There are, are groups and, and cultures that are separate and distinct in each of these countries that are so unique. I mean, we, we think of the UK as this 
homogenous thing and the Welsh are completely different than the English and the Scottish and the Irish. And uh, from our perspective in America, we look and kind of lump them all together. Sim similarly, in, and if you go to Germany, the Bavarians, I mean, we saw this when we traveled, the Bavarians were very different than the Germans you might find in another part of town, similarly France. Um, biggest takeaway is, is uh, these cultures are very rich uh, and, and you can't quite experience them from afar. When you get there, get enmeshed in the culture, see the geography, see the history, you come away with a life-changing experience. That's great. Thank you so much um, for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thanks for your support at Wheaton College for this center. Um, and blessings on you and your family. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you sometime next fall when we're able to meet without masks uh, for the 50th uh, anniversary celebration of Wheaton's International City Program. That's fantastic. Thank you for having us. Thanks, David. Thanks for Thank you for having us. Bye. Okay. Thanks. You have been listening to Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics podcast. Three things with host David Iglesias. Join us again in two weeks for a new interview with an accomplished faith, political, and business leader.